microphone. Oh. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. It's our professor Steve Chamo, uh, who is a professor of nuclear engineering at NC State and specializing in industrial plasma uh, processes. He receives all his degrees, bachelor, master, and PhD at the University of Michigan. And then in 1999, he went to Silicon Valley and he worked for Applied Materials Incorporated. In 2008, he joined NC State's uh, nuclear engineering faculty and he started the fourth state application research lab, or in short, four star. And currently, he has 50 referred uh, journal papers and over 100 US and international patents in the area of plasma processing and plasma technology. Please join me welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been teaching mainly, I, was, I actually had a chance to teach Dr. Epen's uh, 201 class. Make sure the microphone's running here. Yeah, we're good. Uh, I had a chance to teach Dr. Epen's 201 class to actually see a few familiar faces from yesterday. It was really exciting. I think the yesterday and today are the first time I've gotten to talk to a, talk to a full classroom because I'm usually teaching, I've been teaching graduate classes lately. So it's usually been like five, six, seven people. So this is really exciting. Thank, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my past life when I was working in Silicon Valley and kind of how it applies to some of the work that we do here in the nuclear engineering department at NC State University. Um, I don't have a dedicated slide for it, but I obviously want to acknowledge uh, the hard work that all my students have put into this. I'm showing their work. and I'm just going to get to stand up here and brag about it for a while. Um, so, but if any of you are interested in any of the work that we're doing or anything that you've seen in the presentation today, our lab is just over the other side of this wall on the back side of the high bay um, in, the old clean bio, in the old biomedical cleanroom space. And we love showing off all of our toys. So if anyone's ever interested in seeing it, feel free to stop by. So with that, I want to try to motivate why we do the work that we do in our, in our research group or you know, a subset of the work that we do in our research group. And to do that, what I want to show is I want to show a, a scanning electron microscope image of something that is probably in some of the devices that you currently have in your pockets. This is a um, NAND memory device fabricated by Samsung. And what it shows is a multi-stack, I'm going to point instead of use the clicker because the pointer doesn't work whenever we're doing the online stream. But what you have is, is you have a stack of silicon dioxide and silicon nitride layers through which you etch these, these, big, these holes and fill them with material. And, this kind of, and what this is, is each of, these, each of these stacks serves as a small capacitor that you charge or discharge, and that's how you store, that's how you store ones and zeros on your computer, and that's how, that's how your, your non-volatile memory works, especially on, on your, on your, on, on, on your um, multimedia-type devices like your phones and your tablets. So the challenge is, this is one micron across. How do I etch something that's on the, on, on the, on the sub-micron scale with up to 100 to 1 aspect ratio, so it's 100 times deeper than it is wide? And how do I do this hundreds of millions of times across a silicon wafer that's about 300 millimeters in diameter? OK, because this is, this, is, this is, you can imagine that we can't build a drill. We can't use a shovel. We've got to get really creative in how we try to make these devices. And so what, and, 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 and the whole idea of this and what really motivates the work that goes on, the, the, the mo work that goes on in, in fabricating electronic devices is trying to make everything smaller and smaller. Everything I put up here is, if you can make this smaller, you can make, a smaller, mem you can make smaller memory devices. If you can make smaller memory devices, you can put more memory on a given chip. And now you can go from things that can store text messages to things that can store pictures to things that can store videos to things that can now start to store three-dimensional virtual reality type, type environments. And that's really, and that, and, that's, and, 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 by, and, and that all comes about by making these electronic devices smaller. So the best cartoon that I have for trying to explain, other than trying to pack more memory onto a silicon chip, is also how do you make computer chip, chips faster? Now, historically, the way you make computer chips faster is you make each of the individual devices that make up a computer chip as small as possible. The basic idea is this. This is the basic building block of pretty much ever, any, any logic device that you have on any of your electronic devices. What you have is, is you have, this is a cross-section, so we're looking into a wafer of silicon. And 
And what we have here is we have two different types of silicon. We have P-type silicon and N-type silicon. The only difference is, is that they're doped with different elements and they have different majority charge carriers. But the, but the key takeaway is that under normal conditions, I cannot pass electric current from my source to my drain because I have dissimilar charge types between my N-type silicon and my P-type silicon. If I place a small capacitor between them, though, and I apply a voltage, I can invert the characteristics of the semiconductor between my source and drain, and I can flow current. So if I do not apply a voltage, I have an open circuit. I have a zero. If I apply a current, if I apply a voltage to my oxide, or to my, to my gate, I can flow current from my source to my drain, and that's a one. And that's the building block for logic devices. Okay? Now the idea is you want this logic device to run as fast as possible. In order to do that, it's a, simple, it's, it's, it's a really simple equation. The speed of the device on first order is determined by how much time it takes from an electron, for an electron to travel from point A to point B. The time it takes to close that circuit. And it's a geometry problem. All right, the shorter the racetrack, the faster the race. And if we can make this device smaller, we can make the device faster. Now, there's a trick to it. One of the things we have to do to make these things smaller, unfortunately smaller a lot of times also means deeper, as we showed for the memory devices. And what's shown here are holes that are drilled into, this is holes drilled in silicon. Each of these holes is approximately um, 500 nanometers in diameter. And they're 100, 110 times deeper than they are wide. So the CD on this one, I'm sorry, the CD, the critical dimension on this one is 200 nanometers right here. So about 2,000 atoms wide. And the way you do this is you take fluorocarbon gas and a pattern wafer. And in fact, I'm, gonna, I'm looking in the back here. I'm going to see if I can get one of my... Mo, do you know where the, the silicon, the 300 milliliter silicon wafers are at the entrance of the lab? Or do one, any of you guys know where they're at? Can you go grab them? Just grab one of them, grab one of the big ones. So the idea is that, you, is that you basically run, and in fact, in industry, we call them a recipe. You take a wafer, you put it into a plasma chamber. You take a fluorocarbon gas, which actually is not, in itself, not all that toxic. Uh, carbon tetrafluoride was used for years for silicon processing. And if we filled this room with, silicon te with carbon tetrafluoride, the only thing we would do is asphyxiate ourselves because we just took all the oxygen out of the room. It's not toxic at all. However, if I bombard these molecules with a bunch of electrons, I can break apart those molecules and I can make CF2, which is the monomer for Teflon, or I can make atomic fluorine. So I can either deposit Teflon on surfaces or I can, or I can have atomic fluorine, which can chemically react with things. And I do this with a plasma reactor. Now, to just give you some perspective, because it's hard for us to visualize being macroscopic human beings and whatnot, just how small this is, I want to give you some perspective on how small the devices are in your computer chip. And to do that, what I'm showing here is a similar device. Again, this is a 200 nanometer uh, critical dimension device. This is just a, a different device. And I'm overlaying on it the relative size of an Ebola virus um, relative to what makes up your computer chip. So this would be the distance between your source and your drain. Actually, I'm sorry, this would be your gate here. This, is your, this would be where your source and your drain, you're eventually going to put tungsten contacts in here. And this is going to be your, this is going to be your transistor device I just showed you. And so that's about 280 nanometers across. That's actually pretty old. These are um, recently fabricated devices that are 15 nanometers across, so 150 atoms wide. And this is an Ebola virus. And this is why one of the biggest costs of making computer chip is actually the clean room. Because if you have something like a virus land on top of your computer chip while you're trying to process it, it will shadow out multiple devices and can actually ruin your process. So a typical room like this will have a million particles per cubic foot that are one micron or, or, or larger. So a million particles, right? Typical clean rooms where they fabricate these devices will have less than 10. So that gives you some idea of just of the cleanliness of the clean, of the clean room. And that actually be, is actually one of the big driving costs of being able to operate one of these facilities is just cleanliness. So how do we make these holes? How do I make something like this that's, that's very anisotropic that I can drill into it, that I can drill into silicon? Because if you think about a chemical reaction, we're driving this thing with chemistry. So if I, if I have a piece of silicon 
and I start etching a hole in it, the chemical reaction is going to be isotropic. And it's going to equally react on the sidewalls just as much as it does et etching down into the silicon. So how do I make an anisotropic hole that goes straight down if I have a chemical reaction, which if we think about it, is going to, is going to equally react with all possible surfaces? Now the trick for doing this, this is a classic experiment that was done, I think this paper came out in 1991, so it's an old one, but it's an amazing paper. In fact, this one I think is, was, is pretty much in every single plasma processing textbook you can find up to this day. Colbert and Winters who worked at IBM Almaden Labs in San Jose, California, were trying to figure out how to solve the, the problem I just posed. How do I get a chemical reaction to only occur in one direction? And they did an experiment. They took a silicon wafer and they had two sources that they were, that they were, that they were, that they were exposing the silicon to. The first was a xenon difluoride source which would come in, the, fluoride, the fluorine would dissociate and you get atomic fluorine and you get a chemical attack of the silicon wafer. The second one was an argon ion source where you accelerated argon ions to about 500 electron volts and you impinge those ions on the surface. So whenever they just turned on the xenon fluoride source, what they found was, was that the fluorine would come down, they'd produce silicon tetrafluoride, it would be removed from the system, and they would etch, they would remove silicon at about five angstroms a minute. Whenever they turned off the xenon fluoride source and they just turned on the argon ion source, they would, the argon ions would come down and ballistically, and it's billiards, it's, 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 it's the break in pool. An ion comes down with sufficient energy, it smacks into the silicon atoms and ejects them from the surface. And using that, just using that ballistic method, you can also remove about five angstroms a minute of silicon. So they're about the same, right? Your chemical attack in this, Experiment and your, and your ion ballistic attack are about the same. So then they have a hypothesis. Well, if I turn both of these on, what happens? If they don't work synergistically with each other, if they work independent of each other, then I should get about 5 plus 5 equals 10 angstroms per minute of removal rate. But what they found was when they turned both of them on, the fluorine and the argon ions came down and they increased the removal rate of silicon by, a factor, by, by over a factor of 10. So the conclusion here is, since it wasn't additive, this was a process that where, they, where the ions were mutually working with the, with the reactive species that were coming from the, from the, from the xenon difluoride, and you had, and you, and they were, in, and, and, and they were, and it was a, it was a synergistic process that was removing the silicon. So just by including the argon ions, I was able to increase the rate of my silicon removal, the rate at which I can etch into that hole by a fact, by over a factor of 10. So as long as I have directional ions and a, a, and a source of reactive, reactive species, I should be able to etch, I should be able to get this chemical reaction to work in whatever direction the ions are moving in. And it actually turns out that um, the explanation for this, this was some work that was done a little bit later, and this is a molecular dynamic reaction, is what happens is, is if I have by these, uh, these, uh, these Holes here, and the argon ions come. Is, is is the argon ions will break bonds in the silicon in the silicon matrix, and ex, and, and reduce the barrier for the fluorine to come in and and break additional silicon bonds, and that and thereby thereby accelerating the removal rate of silicon. So basically, what you're doing is is the argon ions are coming in and breaking bonds, not requiring a chemical process to do it. The fluorine comes in, takes up that bond. And then eventually you can remove you can remove the silicon. You can actually, and there's two things you can do here. You can add directionality to the process. And the other thing you can do is, is you can actually run these processes at much lower temperatures. So those of you who've taken chemistry and material science classes know that most chemical reactions follow an Arrhenius relationship. The reaction rate increases exponentially with time given some given some thermal rate constant. Right? So if I want to if I want to decompose a molecule or I want to get a reaction to occur on a surface, I usually have to heat it up. What plasmas allow you to do, or what this process allows you to do, I haven't gotten to the plasma part yet, is it allows you to keep the silicon pretty much at room temperature because all the energy is being deposited on the very near surface within the first few atomic layers of the silicon, right? And this allows you to, and this allows you to run the silicon at much lower temperatures and get a chemical reaction rate that you would normally only be able to get at about 
if you if you were to if you were to if you were to heat up the silicon to levels that would be um, that would adversely impact the electrical performance of the devices that you're trying to fabricate. So fortunately, this technology exists. I want to make sure I didn't miss a slide there. I didn't. Okay. If I take CF4 gas and I feed it into a plasma reactor. Now a plasma reactor is simply a vacuum chamber where I apply electromagnetic energy and this electromagnetic energy will accelerate electrons to sufficient velocities that they can then ballistically break apart molecules. And they also ballistically ionize neutral gas species so I can produce electron ion pairs. Now these electron ion pairs, these this ionized gases are what make up a plasma. But this is a unique plasma in the sense that only a very small amount of the gas is actually ionized. The main thing that you're getting out of this plasma is you're getting electrons interacting with these molecules and cracking them and forming reactive byproducts that can interact with different materials. And you'll see in this reactive chain that two key ones that we produce are CF2, which is a polymer chain, so I can grow polymer on top of a wafer if I want to, and atomic fluorine. And as we showed in the previous slides, atomic fluorine will chemically react with a silicon and allow you to start to remove silicon from the surface and start to etch these holes. Um, this is an example of such a system that does this. This was actually one of the last systems I worked on when I worked for my, when, before I came to NC State, I worked for a company called Applied Materials. So Applied Materials is a capital equipment company, a factory that is being built by a company like um, Samsung or Intel or Micron, right? Is, is what, they, what they do is, is that the, the Applied Materials builds all the machinery and all the, all the systems that go into fabricating the silicon chips that, that the Intels or Samsungs or Microns are trying to produce. So these tend to run at very high vacuum. You can see down here a little turbo pump. And by little, I mean about this big around. It's filled with uh, high carbon steel blades that spin at about 40,000 RPM. You have about, in this particular system, we have about 15 kilowatts of RF power, which is comparable to the amount of power that's produced at NC State's local radio station. Um, let's see here. You have, uh, so what basically what will happen is in this chamber is you'll produce vacuum conditions that almost mirror conditions you find in space. You apply more RF power than a local college radio station. You apply, you, you insert some gas of, that has some, some atomic or molecular makeup that you want to try to produce. And when you mix it all together, you have chemically reactive species that will, that will react with the silicon. What you also get in the absent, in, in, around the periphery of a plasma, you get something really interesting called a plasma sheath. And a plasma sheath is actually pretty simple, is, 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 is kind of simple to understand. The basic idea is this. If I take a chamber and I fill it up with an equal number of electrons and ions, right? And let's say they have the same temperature. Everything's room, for argument's sake, let's make everything room temperature, okay? And anything that touches the wall neutralizes. If, I have an, if, the, if the walls are grounded, the electrons are going to hit the wall and go to earth ground. The ions are going to combine with an electron on the surface and they're going to neutralize. Okay? So let's just do a thought experiment here. Actually, what, did, I make, I didn't do, did I do the thought experiment already in this class? I might have. We might come back to this. I think I have it on a later slide. Maybe I do. It's a mystery. Can't wait to find out. Okay. One thing I want to emphasize, but so so. What, but what this one thing? I, one thing I'll say just in, just to, before we get into the nuts and bolts of it, is that what happens is is you get an electron depletion around the surface of the plasma, and the, and this electron depletion is because the electrons are so much less are so much lighter than the ions that at a given temperature they have a much higher velocity, so they stream to the walls first. They stream to the walls before the big stupid ions know what's going on. And what's left is an, a net positive volume charge around the periphery of a plasma that produces an electric field. This electric field then accelerates the ions perpendicular to the, to, perpendicular to the surface and bounces the electrons back into the plasma. So the electrons are bounced back into the plasma and they can, they can dissociate more molecules. And the ions are accelerated to the surface, always perpendicular to the surface because that's how it works using Maxwell's equation. So now I have my ion bombardment and I have my reactive species which are the two key things that Colburn and Winter showed in their study I need in order to accelerate the removal of silicon using fluorine gas. 
Now, I do want to kind of just as an aside, since this is a, since this is a nuclear engineering seminar, um, I do want to point out some of the similarities and some of the headaches that we have in, in plasma science that, that parallel things that you have to deal with in nuclear engineering. So I like to try to do this every now and then, try to point out that, we're, that yes, we do belong in this department, because sometimes everyone wonders. And what I want to show is I want to show something that you're all familiar with, cross-sections. And, you always, and, and in nuclear engineering, you always have to deal with miserable energy-dependent cross-sections for absorption and for fission and for whatever else it is you do in those reactors. And there's two things you have to worry about. If you have to worry about the rate of fission or the rate of absorption or the rate of scattering, is you have to worry about the shape of that cross-section. And you also have to worry about the energy distribution function of your neutrons. Because it's going to be the integral of that neutron flux and that cross-section that's, that's going to determine the rate of different processes that's happening in a nuclear reactor. Now the challenge in nuclear engineering is that these things are rarely flat. Sometimes they're flat and sometimes they're not. And one of the headaches is dealing with cross-sections that aren't flat. And we have the exact same problem in plasmas. So these are three cross-sections that I pulled off of an online database. It's kind of like similar to, you're going to have to help me out here. What's the database you got to go to for the neutron cross-sections? NDIF. This is plasma version. So LXCAT is the, is the version of, uh, is, is our version of, L, of, of, of NDIF. Okay. We can download these cross-sections. What you can see is these cross-sections can change by two orders of magnitude over, over, over a range of electron temperatures that we would typically find in an industrial plasma. And so we have some real challenges. We also have challenges because depending on your plasma conditions, you can also get, you can, you also get very non-Maxwellian electron energy distribution functions. And the combination of these two things make it very difficult to actually quantify the reaction rates that you get in these reactive plasmas. And so this is an aside, but I thought I would point out that we, that we have cross-sections too, and we like them about as much as you do. So if I take that, I can integrate my cross-section, my electron energy distribution function and velocity, and I can get a reaction rate multiplied by my electron density and my gas density, and I can calculate a reaction rate as a function of, elect of my average electron temperature. Now what's shown here is by assuming a form of, the, of my electron energy distribution function, usually we use a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, even though they never are a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, is that the reaction rate, depending on my electron temperature, can change by orders of magnitude. All right, and so what we're looking at here is these are just elastic collisions. These are excitation collisions that will produce the, the species in a plasma that cause it to glow. All right, so your, your fluorescent lights basically function based on this green line right here. And then the rate of ionization, which is shown by the red line. And all of these have a very strong electron energy dependence. So trying to control this chemistry is not as easy as just turning up or turning down the heat. Everything is very coupled to it. Everything is, 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 is very tightly coupled. And changing temperature or changing power or changing gas pressure, all of these have a significant impact, particularly on this electron energy distribution function, and can greatly change the rate at which reactions are occurring in your reactor. Similar to, I guess, heating up a white light water reactor and seeing what happens. Now, I do want to point out that we should be very happy that plasmas exist. We should be very happy that Colburn and Winters decided that, we wanted to have, that they wanted to shoot an ion beam into a silicon wafer. We should be very happy that plasmas make these amazing sheaths that accelerate ions perpendicular to the surface. And the reason for that is because it was around 1992, 1993, about two years after Colburn and Winters published that paper, that people actually started to use plasmas in computer chip manufacturing. And they used plasma and computer chip manufacturing so they could get that anisotropic processing. Because by getting, having anisotropic processes, I can put stuff closer together. Because if I'm relying on an isotropic chemical process, and I'm etching out those sidewalls, and I'm allowing the chemical reaction to occur in all directions, I'm limited to how close I can put two devices together. Because if I'm, as, I'm, as I'm fabricating the device, if I'm getting lateral blowout, eventually they're going to touch. And I can't have that. I need to have isolated, isolated electrical systems that I can wire together later. Make sense? Okay, so the ability to have this anisotropic processing that plasmas can give you is extremely important. What's shown here, I just want to show here, that this was about the time they started cutting in plasmas into volume computer chip manufacturing. In case you're wondering, so that's 1992. These are probably processors you, most of you haven't even heard of. But just to give you some idea, this is around the time I was... This is around the time I was an undergraduate at Michigan. And I think that we had computers that had amazing clock speeds of, I believe, up to 20 megahertz. 
Um, thank you. <laughs> um, and so without plasmas, we had eight megabytes of memory, a 500 megabyte hard drive if you were lucky. Flat panel displays didn't exist because you couldn't fabricate flat panel displays on plastic because you couldn't use plasmas to drive chemical reactions at low temperatures. Um, you had 24-bit video, 28.8 kilobit per second connectivity, and your clock speed was around 33 megahertz. So those of you who bought a computer any time in the past few years probably know that this would be, if you, the, your phone, right? Crap, your watch. Your watch probably has more computing power than what I wrote my PhD thesis. <laughs> and it was the, and, and, the, and I want to emphasize that it was the cutting in of plasma technology that allowed computer chips to get smaller and eventually accelerate in speed to the point to where we are today. Now, we are at a point where just making the devices smaller, we've hit a bit of a wall because devices nowadays are 10 atoms wide. And you can't, well, you can split an atom, but you don't necessarily want to do it in your computer. So we're, getting, we're hitting a limit with how small we can make these things. But we are getting creative. You, you, if, you, if you ever, multi-billion dollar industries find a way. And so what you have is you have new devices that are trying to replace this planar device that I showed you earlier. All right, these are quantum dot, these are quantum dot transistors that have been fabricated. Okay, so the idea is actually quantum computing, which we actually, I guess we have one of those at NC State now. Um, FinFET transistors, so actually taking that gate element that, that isolates the source and the drain and flipping it on its side so I can stack them like books as opposed to having a flat planar surface. FinFET transistors, atomic layer processing. So if you look here, this is a TEM, this is a TEM of, a, um, of, atom of atomic layer etching. So removing, basically trying to etch silicon layer by layer so that it, without doing any damage to the silicon crystal underneath. So these are the types of things that we worry about now. And so this kind of changes the game for plasma processing. Before, we worried about just doing it faster. It's still a manufacturing process, so we got to go fast. Right? So we worry about etch rate, etch selectivity, etching the silicon but not the stuff that's not silicon that we want to try to keep. Um, trying different materials. Dual damascene processing was how they finally were able to put copper into your, silicon, in, into your computer chips. Moving forward, um, making, making, making more complex, more complex shapes, uh, high aspect ratio features, complex material stacks, the, sil the oxide, nitride oxide stacks I was showing earlier for memory. Moving forward, at least one person's opinion for whatever it's worth, is trying to find new pathways for anisotropy to try to make devices like this. Advanced chemistry control and also minimal device damage down to the atomic scale. We can no longer hit these devices with 500 volt ions and expect the device to work. They're too small. You will obliterate the device. And so now the one maiden tool that we've been using for decades to be able to drive these anisotropic processes to make these computer chips is actually a hindrance. Because it only takes, who's taken 409 or 509? Okay, what's the, I'm gonna put you on the spot. So what's the typical, it's, 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 a, it's like a pop quiz. What's the, typical, what's the typical energy an ion needs to displace an atom from a lattice? What's the typical displacement energy? 20 EV. Okay, so you can imagine what a 500 EV ion can do. It does have enough energy to start damaging the lattice structure of, these, of, of this material, right? And so, and, so, and so now, those 500 EV ions that we've been relying on for years are actually something we're trying to, or something we don't necessarily want anymore. We still want the anisotropy, but we've got to find another way to do it. So I want to focus on the ions for right now. And what I'm showing here is examples of if you change the mass or the energy of a particle, you, have, you get very different outcomes. Um, if you're going slow, you'll just trash the front end of your car, which as my 16-year-old daughter demonstrated two weeks ago, <laughs> is still enough to get it totaled. Um, and then you have... And then you have, um, you have a slightly, this is the, her new car, because this way she's safe and we don't have to, and the car will never get totaled. So this is her new car now that she trashed the old car. And going at a slightly faster speed, you have a very different effect on the things that you strike. Similarly, ions, the ion energy and the ion mass, depending on how you engineer your system, have a very, will, will interact with silicon and other materials on the, on the surface very differently.
Now this is, is as ridiculous as the previous slide was. Actually, here's a molecular dynamic simulation of exactly what we're trying to do here. We have a 200 EV ion come in, and it rattles just the first few monolayers of the silicon crystal. So this is a silicon crystal at room temperature. That's why all the things are rattling around. So we, you can see we start to produce a damage layer on the surface here. Another ion comes in. <laughs> it's coming. There we go. And it heats everything up. But what I want you to notice is we're not heating the bulk silicon. We're heating the first five, ten monolayers of the silicon. The rest of it's sitting pretty much at room temperature. These things aren't rattling around that much more. But what we are producing is a huge damage layer on the surface where we can accelerate these chemical processes. And the energy of those ions have a big impact on the depth of this damage layer, the amount of damage you're getting, and what the effective temperature is near the surface to be able to drive that chemical reaction. So if we can control the ion energy in these systems, we can control these chemical processes and we can make smaller computer chips. And that's kind of what I've been playing around with for way too long. So what gives an ion its energy in the first place? This goes to the, the quiz I was going to give you earlier, but I just remembered I had the slide, so we'll just use those. So what I have here is I have an example of what an RF, what, what a plasma looks, what, what a system for a plasma looks like. I have an RF generator. I have two parallel metal plates. And you've all experienced it, either on a dry winter day or, or just turning on a light, uh, an incandescent light bulb. If I, put a volt, if I fill two plates with a gas and I put a high enough voltage between those plates, I'm going to break down the gas, right? I'm either going to go touch the doorknob and get that annoying little shock in the winter. You don't get them as much in North Carolina as you get in Michigan. I grew up in Michigan, and from like November until February, you were zapping yourself every single time you touch something metal. It's one nice thing living in a humid state. It doesn't happen as often. Okay? But you get the idea that if I put a high enough voltage between two conductors, I can get a discharge. I can ionize that gas. You've all seen it. Now, depending on what frequency, don't worry about... Don't worry, I don't want you to worry about the physics of this right now. The only thing I'm, reason I'm showing this is because this is one of the main tools that we use to drive what, what kind of plasma we're trying to make for processing. We have two competing things for, for this manufacturing process, right? We have, we want to make chemical, we want to make reactive chemicals, and we want to make, excel, we, and we want to have ions with some energy to hit the surface. We need the combination of both. We need to control that. Zero order control for plasma processing is to be able to control the ion flux and the amount of chemical reactivity you're producing. One of the easiest ways you can do that is just by picking the right frequency for that RF generator. If I pick a very high frequency, what I get is I get, this is electron density, the density of my plasma, the amount of number of electrons I have per unit volume versus the voltage across the, 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 sheath, the sheath of my plasma, that, 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 that voltage drop that I get because all my electrons went away. And if I have a very high frequency, I get very high electron densities, and relatively low sheath voltages. If I have very low frequencies, what I get is I get very low electron densities and very high sheath voltages. And, and, and what happens is, is that depending on what gas I have in the system, it'll follow one of these trajectories. Well, what I can also do, because engineers are smart, is I can say, well, why don't I just pick one of these and one of these use both of them at this exact same time. And I'll use this one to make electrons and this one to use ions. Now there's a second effect that happens whenever you pick a frequency. And that's what happens to the distribution. It's not just the, the energy of the ions that's important here, and I'm going to show why in a second. But it's actually the energy distribution function. How many, if I have, if my average energy is 100 volts, how many of those ions are 10 volts? How many of those ions are 200 volts? Because as the car example just showed, I get a 10 volt ion is going to do something very different than a 200 volt ion, right? And I want to be able to control that. Now, one of the things that happens is that depending on where I pick my frequency, either, either, either high frequency or low frequency, what happens is, is that my plasma is oscillating with that applied voltage. And as it oscillates, the ions will pick a specific energy given the phase that they enter the sheath relative to the RF power supply. And at very low frequencies, I can get a very broad ion energy distribution function. So the ions are averaging 100 volts, but they're going from 0 to 200. Or I can increase the frequency, and I can get pretty much all my ions to hit at the same energy. And you can imagine that both of these, that, that these two cases are going to have two very different effects on the silicon. 
whether I'm tickling it with a bunch of different energies or I'm hitting them all with one particular energy. So what we found was that if you played around with, if you played around with the frequency combination in these plasmas, a couple other things happen. If you increase your electron density, your, your ion energy distribution function will get fatter. So as you try to make more chemistry, you're affecting your ion energy distribution function. If you try to increase that sheath voltage by turning up the power, then what happens is, is that you might increase the energy. Your average energy is going, in this case, from 500 to 1,500 to about 2,000 volts. But you're also increasing the width. So there's no free lunch. You're not going to be able to just independently control the average energy or the amount of chemistry without also subsequently affecting the shape of the energy distribution function. So we decided to play a game a few years ago. And we wanted to figure out how to control that distribution function independent of all these other things, independent of the chemistry, independent of the voltage, by combining frequencies together. And people who did this in the past, they tried using these really crazy waveforms. Um, so instead of using a sinusoid, they would use these pulse waveforms. They'd use these sawtooth waveforms. And I'm going to skip this just because that was a dumb idea. <laughs> and the reason why it's dumb is if any of you have ever taken, an, an, if any, any of you have ever taken a microwave or RF, RF class, you'll know that the circuitry you need for impedance matching into, an, into a high-frequency system pretty much gives you it's a bandpass filter and lets one frequency get through. And so if you have a broadband, if you, if you have a broadband waveform with a lot of frequency content, you're still only going to get a sinusoid out the other side. That's just how it works. So we decided, well, let's just simplify things. And let's just pick two frequencies, a high frequency and a low frequency. Let's pick a frequency that by itself is going to give us all our ions at one energy. And let's give us another frequency where all the ions are going to give us that big fat distribution. And let's combine the two together and see what happens. And sure enough, what we found out was that if I control the, frequency, the fraction of my low frequency current, I can dial in between a relatively monoenergetic ion energy distribution function and a very broad ion energy distribution function. So what I do by combining these frequencies is I can now control that energy distribution function. Right? I can dial it in. I can either have that truck plowing through cars or I can have a bunch of or that, little, that little car with all the guys running off or I can have a little bit of both. And I can decide that on my system by just uh, partitioning my power between two different frequencies. Is it important? Turns out it is. One of the things, remember, this is, this is a sketch of a high aspect ratio hole, just like I was showing on those previous pictures, trying to etch into, in this case, we're etching into glass, but same difference. We're trying to etch a big, deep hole into it. What I'm showing here is that what happens a lot of times in these processes is that as the hole gets deeper, it's hard to push reactive stuff down. And so the holes will start to taper. And they'll start to get thinner and thinner as you get towards the bottom. And what we found was that by mixing, by, by mixing different amounts of low frequency power, we could affect the, we could control the slope of the sidewall, and we could either make this completely vertical or control this taper angle. Which means that now we can start to engineer using a plasma, we can start to engineer the actual shape of these holes that we're drilling into the silicon. And that was nice. That was actually, this was. This actually ended up in, um, for a while I got to brag and say that, in fact, my daughter got in trouble for it. At one point she was giving show, we were doing like, what does your dad do for a living? And my dad said, my, and, and my, my daughter told the teacher that, um, well, my dad makes a machine that makes all the computer chips. And, and, and the teacher actually wrote to us and said, your daughter's, I gotta stop exaggerating. And the irony was at the time was she wasn't. That actually every fab that was built between, I think, 2004 and 2008 had a machine that I had a patent on. So she was right. And so we wrote the teacher back and told her that. And then the, uh, and the teacher was like, sorry. <laughs> so can we do more? If we can affect high aspect ratio etching by playing with the width of the distribution function, can we, can we do more? And so we started playing around. This actually goes towards the stuff that we started doing now that I'm at NC State, was trying to figure out how we can better engineer these distribution functions. So before we just pick two random frequencies, what if instead we pick two frequencies that are integer harmonics of each other? Can we control the phasing between integer harmonics and better control the ion energy distribution function? And so we did some work. This was done on, this was done on, where's Yua? Is he here? He's not here? <coughs> So, you, so, so one of my students, you, you was working on a chamber Medusa that where we did some experiments uh, a few years ago.
And what we did was is we built a sheath model. We built an analytical model to try to predict by phasing these different, the, by phasing these different, RF, these different RF power supplies, could we modify the shape of the distribution function? So we made a really simple, stupid model. And, and you can tell because it doesn't match the experimental results very well. It actually, do, actually it matches them pretty well. We were able to predict the width of the distribution. We were able to predict the relative location and magnitude of some of these peaks just with a simple little distribution, a this, this simple little model. And then we hooked up our retarding field energy analyzer to an experiment to try to validate the model and got pretty good agreement. That's what these dotted lines are. These were measurements we made in the lab um, up, uh, when it was upstairs on the third floor. Of course, it wasn't perfect, so then we turned to Mark Kushner over at the University of Michigan who has a fully self-consistent plasma model that accounts for plasma chemistry and sheaths and everything else. And we sent him some data. We, this, was, this was our measured results, and this was our, this was, this was the, these, these were the results he took for ion energy distribution function for three different phases between, between, two, harmonic, between, two, between two harmonic power supplies. And we got very good agreement between what we measured and what they got with a more, so basically our model sucked. It was good enough to prove the point, but to get a more accurate result relative to experiments, we just needed a more complex model. Skip this. Actually, do I want to skip that? Okay, let me talk about this for one second. So what does phasing do? All right, phasing does not change. If you look here, phasing really doesn't change the width of the distribution function very much. It only changes how many of the ions are sloshed to one side of the average versus the other. So you're basically playing with, you're not playing with the width of the distribution function, you're playing with the skew. You're playing with the higher order uh, the higher order moments of the distribution function. So skew, and what's the one that, so you got, you got mean, you got width, so standard deviation, you got skew, which is, that, which is, which is the, the third order moment. Anyone know what the, what the, what the, fourth, the fourth order is called? Kurtosis. Kurtosis. Fun fact. Probably the only part of the seminar some of you will remember, but just remember kurtosis, and everyone will be like, everyone will be like, you know that you should get some, they have penicillin for that. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, we don't change the width, but we change the skew. This just shows we change the skew some more. Is it important? Again, with industry, the rubber, where the rubber hits the road, whether or not this work is important is what's it doing on a silicon wafer. And if I go back to those memory devices, you all have stuff on your phones and your watches and your iPads and everything else. What I'm showing is I want to etch alternate layers of oxide, silicon dioxide and silicon nitride, silicon dioxide and silicon nitride. Now these are two completely different com you know, compositions and I'm trying to use the exact same plasma to etch both of them. And as it turns out, we did an experiment with Tokyo Electron where we did measurements of the ion energy distribution function at two different phases, running two different frequencies into their cathode. So Tokyo Electron is a company just like Applied Materials. They make the machines that Intel's. In fact, they were doing this. This experiment was conducted at a, at a fab in Albany, New York that's run by IBM. So this was actually run on an IBM tool. And we measured the ion energy distribution function for two different phases, running two megahertz and four megahertz and showed that we could get very different distribution functions based on the phase of these two, these two things. Is it important? Turns out it is. As we changed the power that we were putting into the cathode, by playing with the phasing, we could, we could engineer the relative removal rate of the silicon dioxide relative to the silicon nitride. So what would happen is if we didn't have any control over this, what would happen is the oxide would etch fast, then the nitride would etch slow and then the oxide would etch fast, and the nitride would etch slow. And what would happen then is because you still have some chemical attack on the sidewalls, you'd get this scalloping effect where the silicon nitride would widen out, the oxide would stay narrow, and you'd get kind of like this caterpillar effect all the way down the hole because you were laterally etching one faster than the other because you had to chew on it longer with the plasma. And it turned out, well, we can control that by playing with the skew. So this actually enables us to do very, 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 uh, narrow high aspect ratio processes on these complex material stacks. And that allows us to be able to make, this is, gives us tunability of the relative etch rates between these stacks and allow us to make higher density devices. Skip this. I know we're running out of time, so I'm skipping some stuff here. Um, we want to be able to measure the ion energy distribution function. This was some other work we did with Tokyo Electron where we actually built a retarding field energy analyzer. It's Tokyo Electron, of course, so we had to 
we had to scale it relative to, to, one, to one yen, not a quarter. But you still get the idea. It's about the same size. And this is an ion. So basically, you have the ions come into this thing. You bias these, these, these plates at different potentials, and you're able to measure these ion energy distribution functions. And we actually embedded this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a manufacturing system so that they could do this while they were etching the silicon. Um, skip this. Ah, but I do want to give credit. I do, want, I do want to give some credit. So Yao, who, who, who's, who's sitting right, right there, is doing some work we're presenting next week at the Gaseous Electronics Conference. And I, did want, I, want to close with the, I want to close with this one. So bear with me for a second. So what happens, now think about what we're doing here. If I have a hole in silicon, and all the ions are coming straight down, but the electrons are still getting there too. Right? You, the rule in plasmas is you lose electrons as fast as you lose ions. Okay, plasmas are like everything else in nature. They're lazy. They want to be at the lowest energy state possible. And the lowest energy state for plasmas is something called quasi-neutrality, where you have an equal number of electrons and ions. And so if you are producing an equal number of electrons and ions, you have to lose electrons and ions at the same rate. And what the sheath does, what that electron depletion region does, is it ensures that I'm losing my electrons and ions at the exact same rate. So electrons are still hitting my silicon wafer, but they're hitting them isotropically. They're not being accelerated. So they're isotropic to start with, and they're isotropic when they get down to the wafer surface. And so what I get is, is I get electrons flooding the top part of this device. And when the electrons hit the surface, especially if it's silicon dioxide, it charges the surface up, right? The ions continue down with positive charge, and they get down to the bottom, and they deposit positive charge down here. Now, what effect does this have? Well, think about this for a second. If I have an ion coming in, what's this negative charge going to do on the top? What? Well, they neutralize it, but what's, the it, but what's the first thing it's going to do? It's going to attract it. That ion that's coming straight down is going to swing towards those electrons because opposite charges attract. I no longer have all my ions coming down in a straight path. And so what happens is I have ions that will swing, will deflect a little bit and hit the surface here. Now, on the other hand, what I also get is I have this big positive charge build up down here because the ions are coming in, and they're dumping charge on the bottom, but it's positive charge. And so an ion's going to come in, and let's say this is about, this looks like this is about 50 volts down here. So I have a 40 volt ion that comes down. What's going to happen? It's eventually going to hit a 40 volt potential, which, which is going to reflect it back. It's not going to allow, it's not going to have sufficient energy to get through that electric potential. And the ion's never getting, going to get to the bottom of the surface. Now you might be like, who cares? But let me tell you why you should care. Because those nice vertical things that you're etching into silicon that give you your phones and your watches and your whatever, I don't know. The shape of those things are greatly affected by this charge buildup. And what I show here is a really poor attempt at etching those vertical holes and the types of things that can happen if you don't account for these types of phenomena. And what Yao captures in his model is bowing. When the ions come down and they're attracted by those electrons, they slam into the side, but they only do it on the top of the device. And so what happens is, is you blow open that, 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 that hole at the top of the device which means that now I can only put these devices so close together because that blowout means that I cannot put this guy here, this adjacent cell, any closer, or else they interact with each other. And I don't have as much memory in my device. The other problem is, is that if I'm stopping my ions from hitting the bottom, my reaction rate drops. And you can see that exact same phenomenon here is called tapering. And tapering is whenever the ions can't make it to the bottom so that reaction rate slows down, and eventually you neck off your process and you can't etch any further. In fact, you can be etch stop. If you look at this, seven minutes, eight, nine, ten. If you plot this out, you can actually see that the process is actually slowing down. At eleven minutes, it stopped etching. You're not any better off at twelve minutes. And if the thing you're trying to hit is is here, well, you're screwed. Especially if you're trying to wire two devices together, right? If I'm going to fill this with metal, if this is supposed to, if I'm going to fill this with metal so I can connect two electronic devices together, I can no longer do it. And so now I can no longer make these devices. And so understanding how this charge accumulates on these surfaces, how these ions interact with the surface, allows us to better understand how to make higher aspect ratio features. So this is some of the stuff we've been doing. This is the stuff we're doing with ion energy now. It's kind of neat. I remember making all sorts of horrible. When I first started in industry, I was a process engineer. So process engineer was I would have the silicon wafers. Let me see that real quick. <laughs> 
so process engineer was, he had silicon wafers. I'll show you an example of one here. Yeah, well, yeah, clips. There we go. So this is what they make your computer chips on. This is a single crystal of silicon. So this was, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying I stole it, I'm just saying applied materials can't find theirs. <laughs> um, actually, I'm, I'm kidding. This is actually one from we got from we were doing, when we were doing some work with Tokyo Electron because it's got silicon nitride deposit on one surface. Silicon nitride makes this beautiful deep blue. Um, it's a thin film that makes this deep blue hue. And then silicon always gives you this, this kind of gray carnival mirror kind of look. But that's a single, single crystal of silicon. There is not a, this is not polycrystalline. Right? So this is like the ultimate in, 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 in rock candy. Now, if you guys can be really careful. So whenever you, so as a, as a fun fact, so think about this for a second. So that's a 300 millimeter, that's a 300 millimeter wafer. How big is a typical, how big is a typical computer chip? What, like an inch by an inch? So you can probably fit, you can fit about two or 300 computer chips on one of those things. So how much, is a, how much does an Intel processor cost? Like 800 bucks, say, for a top of the line one? If you're going to buy your own processor, how much does an Intel chip cost? 1,000 bucks? Okay, so I have 200 Intel. I can fit 200 Intel chips on that. I can grow 200 Intel chips on one silicon wafer. Which means that wafer, when it's at the end of the factory floor, when it's about ready to top of the line, is worth almost a quarter million dollars. And if you go into it, <laughs> And if you go into it, and if you go into a semiconductor factory, what's even more disturbing, so a quarter million dollars, right? They put them in boxes of 25 at a time as they go between the machines. And so you see people walking around, they're called FOOPs. I can't remember what FOOP stands for, but it's basically a big plastic box with 25 wafers inside it, which means you have 25 wafers times $250,000, right? So that's a lot, it's millions, millions of dollars. Right? And so you better make sure your shoes are tied. Because if you drop it, don't it if, if someone's clumsy and drops that, we'll find out what happens. But that thing shatters like a mirror, and it's gone. And that's a quarter million dollars if you just break one of them. That's millions of dollars if you drop the whole box. So anyways, to recap, I mean, that, that doesn't have devices on it, so you don't worry. That one's only worth about 30 bucks, if that. Now that, you, now that your fingers have been all over it, probably less. OK, so what I want. But, so to, to close really quick, with that much real estate on a wafer, you got to make sure these things, that that process is continuous and happening at exactly the same rate. And you're getting the, exactly the same type of feature size and feature shape everywhere. All right? Because these things are money. The other thing about a computer chip fab, fab that you should know about is that a computer chip fab, when they're making a computer chip, those fabs cost about as much as a nuclear power plant. Three to five billion dollars to build one factory. The difference between a computer chip factory and a, and, a, and a nuclear power plant is a nuclear power plant, if they don't get their license renewed, can still run for 40 years. A computer chip factory, as you can tell because iPhone 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, whatever we're at now, right? that technology dies within years. And that fab is obsolete, usually within five to 10 years, which means you've got to pay off a $5 billion loan in less than 10 years. So having these systems run as efficiently as possible with maximum uptime and using every single square inch of that wafer surface is vital. And it's the difference between an Intel, which makes tons of money, and an advanced micro devices, which still is in existence, kind of, but isn't making nearly as much money as Intel. And the challenge is because Intel has nailed manufacturing processes better than anyone else in the world. So to conclude, talking about billion dollar factories, I want to point out that none of those billion dollar factories would exist without, without my graduate students um, or plasma science in general. Right? We develop the basic science that actually enables these, 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 these factories to produce, to produce these amazing products. And we do it because the directional delivery of chemistry and energy to surfaces provided by the plasma systems has enabled the continued advances in manufacturing science at the pace of Moore's Law. If any of you want to know what Moore's Law is, Google it. I'm sure some, most of you have heard of it, but it's basically the pace at which they, in, they, incre they increase the complexity. The complexity of a computer chip doubles every 18 months. That's basically the rule, and the, and the industry has lived by it since the 70s. Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel. 
Um, by engineering this energy distribution function of ions, this plays a significant role in being able to make these devices smaller, make these devices deeper, and produce the more complex topologies that you need for making next generation computer chips. Finally, moving forward, we have additional challenges we haven't had to worry about in the past. Surface roughening, atomic layer processing, vertical processing, and all these things are definitely going to challenge what plasmas can do and whether plasmas are going to continue to play as big of a role in the microelectronic fabrication as they have for the past, I guess it's 30 years now. Oh, it's 30 years. It's been 30 years. That's terrible. I started working on it like two years after they started putting them in factories. Okay. So as you can tell by the title, oh wait, hang on. Acknowledgements. I want to acknowledge, first of all, all of my grad students and all of the people. I want to apologize to, 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 to Yao because even though I showed his slide, I didn't put his name on here because I, I just made the slide like 20 minutes ago. Um, but these are the people who made direct contributions to some of the stuff that we've shown here. These are also some of the funding sources. You can see a good mix of companies and also federal funding agencies that have supported this work. And if any of you are interested in any of this, here's a list of some papers we've written over the years. There's probably a couple more we can add that I forgot about, and then also some of the patents that we got whenever I was in industry doing some of this stuff. So it's been around for a while, and it's pretty fun to talk about. So thank you very much for your attention. No questions? No, no, there's one here. <laughs> so, Steve, you started with all of this business with, you know, applied materials for eight years. And you are continually expanding. And now you are looking into the, you know, the manufacturing and how this can be extremely beneficial. So, when you plan to make a small business company? No, never. I got out of industry for a reason. That's because I didn't want. That's, I got to. I got to see but something. The no. Well, this is the funny thing. So this is a, this is an off topic, but actually, so my dad, for as long as I was growing up, was always self-employed. He always owned his own company. Mm -hmm. And I, one thing I learned from my dad. This is on tape, and I know he's going to hear it later. One thing I learned from my dad was I said I never want to own my own company because you're 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 CEO and chief janitor. I mean, you're you're making deals with the customers, and you're the one who's changing out the toilet paper because small businesses, that's the way it works. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want to go work for a big company. I want someone else taking care of that stuff. <laughs> and so I went to work for Applied Materials, mm -hmm. right? And then, I'm, and then when I started Applied Materials, I started teaching at San Jose State and was like, oh, I want to be a professor. That looks even more like more fun. And then I came back here and I realized something is that as a professor, you're also, you're the CEO and the chief janitor <laughs> of your research lab because the only time that my beautiful students ever come get me is when something breaks. <laughs> so one last thing, I also am going to go ahead and say this online. I want to apologize to Joel for missing his, I want, I want to give you credit for making it to my talk when I obviously was too big of an ass to make it to yours this morning, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I, have a, I, have a, I have a good reason. I'll explain it to you later, but I'm sorry. Other questions or comments? Well, thanks to everyone for staying awake and everything else. Thank you.